We're going to look at the chapter, amazing chapter, John 17. But when we started the book of John, thanks, worship team. Love those guys. When we started the book of John, I asked Bill if I could share a little bit on John 17, and he graciously granted the pulpit to me for this Sunday. And uh, so if uh, you're disappointed that Bill's not preaching, I totally get it. But it's his fault. He, he's letting me do this. Okay? Uh, the title of the sermon is Can You Believe It? I, I really like that title because it's, a, it's, a, it's an exclamation. Can you believe it? And there's a lot of can you believe it in John 17, especially in the area we're going to look at. Uh, Jesus' prayer for the church. But can you believe it is also a question. And uh, God's word really only has any power in our lives when we believe it. Uh, and I got interested in this chapter probably about two years ago, and it just, this chapter to me is a peek into the Trinity. It's Jesus, the God the Son, praying to God the Father and the power of God the Spirit. And God graciously included this in the book of John, that we could just kind of peer in into the throne room of God and hear him pray. Um, you know, he is talking about you. Uh, Jesus is praying for us, and we'll be looking at that. But, so I, I would like to uh, look at one verse that's not in this section. This is really hard to pare this down, because um, the whole chapter, I know Bill started it last week, and amazing Jesus talking about his glory and getting it back, and praying that the Father would be glorified in his death and resurrection. We're skipping a big center part here, so I would like to look with you at chapter 17, verse 13 of John. Before we pray, I'd like to just uh, read this with you and, and bring it out a little bit. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now I come to you. Uh, Jesus is going to go to the Father. He's going to start right after this prayer and walk into the Garden of Gethsemane, and that begins the process of his death and resurrection. <clears throat> so Jesus is saying, my teaching is over. It's time. The hour has come. Now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world. What, what would that be? Could be the last... Uh, 12, or chapter 13 through 17, uh, the last evening of Jesus' uh, incarnation before the death and resurrection. All the things he has taught that night. Or maybe all the things he's taught the last week, chapter 12 on. Or maybe all the things that he's taught, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, these things I speak in the world. Jesus has brought truth from heaven to earth. Why does he speak those? That they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. You know, sometimes we look at the word of God and it maybe doesn't give us complete joy. We think, wow, I'm not, I'm not witnessing like I should. Or, I, I'm full of sin. You know, I'm constantly asking God to forgive me. And we might get a little beat up by the very thing that Jesus wants us to have great joy in. You know, you think about it, we have a God that loves us. He's working everything together for good in our lives. He's promised to provide everything we need. He's making a place for us to live forever in heaven with him. He's going to make us all like Jesus. Every Christian will end up being like Jesus. That should produce a lot of joy in us. But what joy is it? It's not, it's, it's my joy, Jesus says. It's the joy of the Lord. These things I speak in the world that they may have my joy. And how much of it? Fulfilled. Full and filled. Filled. Uh, Jesus' joy in us. And so when we look at God's word this morning, 
it's one of my prayers and has been one of my prayers this week is that that we could be filled with the joy of the Lord as we look at his word. Especially this chapter as we look at how Jesus prays for us. So let's pray together and then we'll we'll get into the the area we're going to look at. Father, we do pray that we would be filled with joy as we as we read this section of scripture, as we look at your prayer for the church. Thank you so much that you included this in your scriptures, Lord, that we can peer into a prayer of God the Son to God the Father and the, pro- and the power of God the Spirit. Lord, I pray that this time would be your time, that you would teach us that things would be clear in your word and that they would be activated in our lives by us believing them. Thank you for these truths, Lord. Some of them are just almost too good to believe. They're amazing. They're exclamations. So help us, Lord, as we look at this section. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's start with verse 20. We'll just read that. Jesus has prayed for himself in verse 17, and then he has prayed for the disciples. In verse 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Who's that? Us. That's Bill. That's me, Mark. It's everyone in here. We're in the Bible right there. That's, that's us in the Bible. We, we shared this in uh, junior high Awanas, and one of the girls got really excited. I am in the Bible. I'm in the Bible. And you guys can all do that right now, okay? Yeah, okay, you won't do that, okay. (laughs) Uh, But we are, there we are. So kind of makes you interested in what Jesus is going to pray for, doesn't it? Well, um, I got a little lost in first service. I'm determined not to do that. Um, yeah, let's, let's read this section here, uh, what Jesus prays for us. Verse 21, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. There's some exclamations in there. There's some things that are amazing to believe. Uh, First of all, uh, the context of this chapter is that Jesus is done with the teaching ministry and on his way to the cross. And it's just wonderful that we have this prayer in the middle of those two ministries of of Christ. And what does he pray for? Verse 21, that they all may be one, as I am one. First of all, I guess I better get to the next. This is the key. If I do these slides, it's on the side. Thanks, Darren. Booby trapped me. Solar eclipse. Bill, let me in on a secret. If you put the slides on, it reminds you of what you're going to talk about. So, uh, God made the sun just the right size, put it out, out there just the right distance, made the moon just the right size, put it out there just the right distance so that when the moon passes in front of the sun, we don't see the sun anymore. We just see the atmosphere around it called the corona. You guys probably heard that word, corona. Uh, Isn't that amazing, Bill? Moon's just the right size, right distance. Sun, just the right size, right distance. 
that we only see the atmosphere of the sun. Now, there's, there's scientists that go to these total solar eclipses just to study the corona of the sun. You know, it, it amazes me that it, this happens uh, about every 18 months on the planet, somewhere on the planet. It happens about every 400 years in one place. But you can go about every 18 months and, and see this happening. And so the science, scientists go and they, and they study this. John 17 is a little bit like that. You know, John 17 is a very unique place where we can peer into the Trinity. We can peer into Jesus' prayer and the power of the Spirit for the church. So we're wondering, what is Jesus going to pray about? First thing he prays about is that we all may be one, the church, that we may be one. This is the first thing he says, that, that you, Father, are in me and I in you. And then that, down in verse 23, he says, or no, excuse me, verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, precisely as we are one. To the same degree as we are one. I get so involved in where I am on my notes, I forget how powerful these truths are. He's praying for the church that we would be one just as, precisely as, to the same degree as, the Trinity is one. Can you believe it? That, that's just really an exclamation mark, isn't it? What, what is the Trinity like? What is the oneness in the Trinity? I have some verses there just to let you know what those were. We know that Jesus is always praying for us, okay? Um, and that, uh, like 1 John 2, 1 says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he always lives to make intercession for us, Hebrews seven twenty five. And uh, it is Christ who is even at the right hand of God who always makes intercession for us. So Jesus is praying for us. So we get a chance to look into, into the Trinity, into this prayer, and see how he is praying for us. One of the, one of the things that in, interests me about how Jesus prays for us is that in 26 verses of John 17, only eight of them, Jesus asks for something. He petitions the Father in eight verses. In the, in the other 18, he declares truth. I think that's a really good example for us. And I see it, I hear it when we have our men's meetings on Friday morning and when we pray together. A lot of times people will pray, you know, Father, we know you love us. We know that your wisdom is far beyond ours. We know that you're going to provide everything we need, Lord. And you're working everything together, together for good in our lives. And you're making us like you. And all these truths that we can declare to God I think it'd be really neat to go to a prayer meeting sometime and start declaring truths about God and then going, God, I pray for... I can't remember what I was going to pray for, you know, because we, we were thinking about how great God is. And we can just say, God, you know what I was going to pray for. You take care of it. So this, this word perichorus, as Dan brought to us about a month ago in Sunday school, it's a very specialized word. It was a, used by the early church to describe the intricacies and the movement and the relationship of the Trinity. It was used by the church fathers. A very theological and specialized word, really just about the Trinity. And it, it means rotation. It means uh, going around. It means individual personalities with no borders or separations penetrating each other. We get the word choreography from it, a dance, kind of like the dance of the Trinity, all this, all this oneness, and yet they are individual and retain their individuality even though they penetrate each other. That's exactly what Jesus is praying for the church, a oneness like the oneness in the Trinity. We penetrate each other. 
We are like drops in an ocean where we lose our identity and become one in this homogenized bunch of water. But we retain our identity. In fact, our individuality will probably be, probably be even more individual in heaven. We'll be who we really are. You're going to like me in heaven. You really are. And I'm going to like you guys too. What a miracle. Okay? <laughs> We're going to be who God intended us to be. So that oneness is a oneness of individuals, but indivisible. Okay? And that's exactly what Paul describes the church as. Uh, oh, I was going to talk about this. We see the Trinity all together working in the creation. You know, the, in the beginning, God, that's Elohim, that's a plural. Okay? And then, and then uh, the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters, the Holy Spirit. Then God said, let there be light, the Word of God, Jesus Christ. So we see the Trinity in creation. We also see the Trinity in the indwelling of God in, in our bodies, in our lives. Jesus said this the same night earlier, John 14. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. You know, I thought it was the Holy Spirit. Well, it is. It's also the Father and the Son indwelling us. It seems whatever one member of, this, of the Trinity does, they all do together. It's the oneness that Jesus prayed for the church. Paul describes that oneness, just what we're talking about. And we sang this. So we being many are one body in Christ, but not a drop in the ocean, and individually members of one, one another. Okay? See what I say next here. Uh, yeah, I will not leave you orphan, orphans. I will come to you. Oh, okay. This is this is uh, <clears throat> what Jesus said about the indwelling. Didn't we already do that? Okay. He says, "But because I live, you will live also." And on that day, you will. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm getting mixed up here. Bear with me. <clears throat> yeah, Jesus has already talked about this oneness earlier that night. He says, I won't leave you orphans. I will come to you a little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You will live also. And here we go. And in that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Um we talk about being in Christ around here quite a bit. It is one of the mysteries and messages of the New Testament. Uh, some scriptures about that. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Him we preach that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Peter ends his epistle, his first one, with peace to all who are in Christ Jesus. After Acts 2, when the church is born, that phrase, in Christ Jesus, happens 85 times in the New Testament. It's really a message that we are in Christ Jesus. We are, um, that is said here in um, verse 22, Verse 20. <laughs> I in them and you in me that they may be made, this is 23, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's in verse 21. The first thing he says, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us kind of stumbling through this, but I want you to understand God the Father has invited us right into the Trinity. Jesus has prayed that we would be one, not only as the Trinity is one, but that we would be one in the Trinity. Very quickly, we're not God. <clears throat> of 
course we're not God. But God loves us so much. And his intimacy with us is so great that he wants us to have the relationship that he has. Isn't that what that says? Um, I in you, that they also may be one in us. Not a minor league oneness, not a junior oneness, not second string. This is the oneness that God has, the oneness of the Trinity. That's what he's praying for the church, that we would be one. Can you believe it? What is the result of this oneness? The end of uh, 21, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the end and the middle of 23, that the world may know that you have sent me. When the, when the world sees the church as one, it will be easier for them to see that this is true. And that happens. You all know, or you know, you, I said that first service. Some of you know about the legendary historic bike trip where a bunch of us guys, usually about a dozen, back before the turn of the century, in 93 was the first one, we would take our bikes and go out to the coast and we would ride down the coast for about three days and we would camp at different campgrounds riding down the coast. We had an absolute ball. It was just a lot of fun every time. We'd be gone for about a week. And uh, I once told my wife, I said, Chris, I hate to admit this, but the, the men's bike trip is my favorite week of the year. And she immediately said, mine too. <laughs> so uh, these are some pictures there. I uh, invited my dad uh, in 93, to our first trip, and he rode bikes a lot. He was 66 years old at the time, and, uh, and he came along. <clears throat> he wasn't a believer. And uh, he, uh, we prayed together, and we worshiped together, and we studied God's word together, and rode our bikes and had a lot of fun together. And at the end of that week, my dad prayed to receive Christ into his life. And uh, he has been walking with the Lord ever since. He's 93. God still has him here. And that's such a blessing to me. He may be streaming, so hi, Dad. I'll talk to you tonight. And uh, <clears throat> But he told me later on, he said, you know what made me realize that this was all true? It was seeing how you guys loved each other. You know, we didn't really know that's what we were doing. We were just having fun together. Dan was a member of that bike trip. He's here. Mike Macy, Mike Chrissy, Richard Cleaver, um, still in the church here that went on that trip. We still love each other a lot. But my dad came to the Lord just like Jesus is saying here. He saw how we loved each other, and he knew this is different. This is true. And we can do that in our oneness. The next word we want to look at is glory. And, and Bill gave this definition last week. Abundance, wealth, treasure, honor, dignity, splendor, brightness, majesty, the glorious moral attributes, and the infinite perfections of God. That's the glory of God. That's what we're talking about. And Let's look at that. Um, there are different kinds of glory before we look to our text. <clears throat> Paul writes this, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. And even the stars themselves differ from each other in glory. So what kind of glory is, are we talking about here? Verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them. We're talking about the glory of Jesus Christ. There's something in there that's very mysterious. It says that God the Father gave Jesus Christ his glory. <clears throat> this is a truth that I don't know if we find it anywhere else in the Bible, but in the throne room here, in the Trinity, in this prayer. The only thing I can say about that is that Jesus has never not been God. He has always been God. I don't get this Father giving the Son the glory, but I know it's true. It's right here. Jesus said it. 
But what's important to us is that glory passed from him. I shouldn't say passed. He still has it. But he shared that glory with the church. God's glory is in the church. I wanted to look with you to Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 21. We'll put it on the screen. But if you want to look at it in your own Bible, sometimes that's really helpful. <clears throat> Let's read it. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So Paul suffered a lot. Bill, Bill listed some of those things last week. He suffered probably more than almost any other man. And Jesus did suffer more than any other man. This life can be very, very hard. There are things that some of you have gone through that are almost impossible to go through and would be without God. Paul's not diminishing suffering here. He's magnifying glory. He's saying even though life is that hard, it's not, even be, it's not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed, not to us, but in us. It will be revealed to us as well. But right here, Paul is saying the glory that will be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The, the creation is waiting for something. You know, we get that. We, we studied Ecclesiastes a couple of years ago, probably now. Looked at how the futility of everything under the sun. The day in, the day out, the ebb and flow of life. And, and we can see it feels like we're all waiting for something. Well, not only us, but the whole creation, the furthest star away, the smallest atom is waiting. And what are they waiting for? What is all of creation waiting for? Can you believe it? Us. There we are again in the Bible, the sons of God. Can you believe that? The whole creation is waiting for the revealing of the glory of the sons of God. The creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into, and here we are again, the glorious liberty of the children of God. The glory that God has given us, that Jesus prays about. And by the way, this is a statement. It's, it's not a request. Um, the glory which you gave me, I have given them. It's a done deal not asking for this. He's stating a truth to the Father. So the glory that we have is what the world is waiting for. And it's in the church. Okay? These are, these are truths that are barely hard to grasp. Can you believe it? Oh, I know your answer is yes. Remember Bob the Builder? Can we build it? Yes, we can. Can we believe it? Yes, we can. Okay. You can go back to John 17 if you did turn. Go back there, but let me uh, give you another scripture here. Just in case we get a big head about all this, I mean, the whole creation is waiting for me, you know. That's, uh, that's something. But uh, we know this is all because of God's immense love. We talked about it in Sunday school. God is love. And we're going to look at that word love, too, in this today. But uh, this is Hannah's prayer after she'd been barren for years and years and years. And now, all of a sudden, God has answered her prayer to have a baby. She's going to have Samuel. And when she finds out she's pregnant, she breaks out in this song, speaking of the Lord prophetically. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among the princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. Who are we in this? We are the poor in the dust. We are the beggars in the ash heap. Who are we in this? We are the ones sitting on thrones. We are the ones on the throne of glory. We're set among princes. All God's work in us. It's what's God, what God has done in us. 
One more verse here on glory. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Don't you love that verse? Jesus is saying, God, bring my church to heaven so I can show them the real thing, the glory, my glory, your glory. Um, God made us to appreciate perfection and beauty, wonder. He loves us to be full of wonder. And we, we get that in his creation, of course. To stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon is, is just amazing, and he made us to enjoy that immensely. But he knows that the greatest experience we're going to have is experiencing his glory. It will be life-changing, and it, it will be completely fulfilling. And Jesus is saying, God, bring them to heaven so we can show them the glory of God. I just love that. He also knows that we're going to be changed when we see that glory. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When we see Christ's glory, that will be the final little twist of the screw or whatever has to happen to make us completely like Christ. The next word and the last word we're going to look at today is love. We find love in this chapter about uh, four times. Not very many, but we find the word give, and Bill mentioned this last Sunday, 17 times in chapter 17. And it's always the love of the Father for the Son or the love of the Son for us, the church. Okay? So there is love all the way through this, this chapter. And we're going to look at a couple, I believe, are amazing verses. First of all, God defines love. Love is defined for us at the cross. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. God defined love right in history. It's an act that happened in our history. Love was defined by the cross. <clears throat> God also commands us to love. Greatest commandment. And he also gives us love, fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> now look at, with me at verse 23. I in them and you in them, and you in me, excuse me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus is not asking for that love. He's not saying, Father, wouldn't you please love the church like you love me? He's stating a fact. The fact is that God loves you in the same way, just as much, to the same degree, with the same love as he has for Jesus. The love, and we talked about this, God is love. And that love has been poured out on us. We sing that song, you know, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. There's no greater fact about each one of us than we are loved by God. By God. With the same love that he has for the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. In verse uh, 24, <clears throat> Jesus says at the end, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Well, that could be a difference maybe in God's love for Jesus and his love for us, but it's not, is it? Ephesians 1.4, just as he chose us, talking about the church, talking about God, choosing us, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well, God has this love, the same love that he has for Jesus, he's always had for you. You personally, each one. Let's get that. 
Let's exclaim about it and let's believe it. God loves you just like he loves the sun. And the last thing I want to mention here about love and pretty much the last thing of the message this morning is the last verse. Verse 26. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it. So God sent Jesus to represent him. He's the image of the invisible God. We learn about God through Jesus. He has declared the name of God to us. We see God in him. And we'll declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. We know, we've, I've even said it in this sermon already, God has put his love in us. Maybe I should say it like this. God has put his love in us. There's no second degree junior love. This is the love of God, the love, the love that was manifested on the cross. We have that same love in us. That's what it says. And I know we believe it. Maybe we don't always see it. But it's true. The love of God is in each and every one of us that have been born again into his spirit. <clears throat> we have no reason not to love everyone. There is not a person that we can't love. We are totally equipped to love everyone we meet. We're commanded to do that. But we're given the equipment to do that too. We have God's love in us. Romans 5.5 5, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out <laughs> in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Church, we are full of the love of God, the same love that God has, God the Father, for his Son. So, just want to say, we've been able to peer into a prayer within the Trinity. And we, I believe we've seen that God in his radical generosity has lavished us with his oneness, with his glory, and with his love. This is truth. Straight from the Trinity, through the Bible, the written word, to our hearts. We should be exclaiming about it, and we should be believing it. The world needs us to do that. We don't see it completely yet, but it's true. Jesus has prayed for it, and we have the glory of God in the church, the oneness of the Trinity in the church, and the love of God in the church. We are an amazing group of people. Not because of who we are. We're dust, you know. We're raised from the dust. We're poor. But God is an amazing God. I've always felt, you know, we're new creations. I've always wondered if this creation is harder for God than the last one. You know, he started with nothing, but in this one he started with me. And that may be a negative. I don't know. Let's pray. Father, I hope that you've been able to speak to us this morning. This is so gracious of you, Lord, to allow us to hear your prayer. You, Jesus, praying to the Father in your power, Holy Spirit. Help us to appreciate. Help us to exclaim. Help us to believe the power and the love and the oneness, the glory that you have placed in the church, your oneness, your glory, your love. Lord, help us to bring glory to you, to bring love to you and to others, and help us to be one. We pray, Lord, that we would pursue these things, 
We would believe these things and we would trust you for these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing one more song. They'll know we are Christians by our love. So let's all stand together.